Welcome to the second episode of the Communication and Behavior Change Accelerator. In this session, we will focus on building awareness on the complex issue of water. How can the water sector build a wider public awareness of water and water issues and what can be learned from other sectors? We will explore techniques and approaches to generate awareness for lasting change. Our first contribution will come from Mina Gulli, an Australian activist who has employed running uh, as a means of creating awareness for water issues. Over the last five years, I've done some pretty crazy things for water. I've run across seven deserts on seven continents in just seven weeks. And a year later, I ran 40 marathons in 40 days down six of the world's great rivers. I've slipped and slid along trails in the Amazon as I've made my way to meet local communities whose livelihoods have been completely destroyed along with their forest. And I ran alongside community water supply trucks in South Africa when we visited towns that had literally run dry. I struggled to carry big, heavy bottles of water, which I passed to young children who were waiting at their gates for their water lifeline, kids who had skipped school to wait for our delivery. And when we left, I turned around and watched as fights broke out on the street when people realised that there was just not enough water to go around. And I ran across the white expanse of Antarctica, the driest continent on Earth, a place so cold my water bottle froze and so quiet I could hear the sound of my own heart beating. But Antarctica is also a place filled with science and information about water. Bubbles in ice cores just like this that can tell us about the links between water and climate change. I think it's easy to look at science and data like this as just numbers on a page. We'll have a 40% water deficit by 2030, or that 3 billion people don't have access to adequate hand washing facilities in the middle of a pandemic. But when we live in cities where water flows freely from our taps and power runs into our homes and we can access food and groceries when we need them, to us, these numbers are cold and meaningless. And to be honest, I think if they weren't, we'd be acting more and we'd be talking less. And the reality is for all of us, these are not just numbers on a page. They're real people in real places around the world. Fishermen just like this, who we were introduced to when we ran in Uzbekistan, living on the banks of what was the Aral Sea, who has watched as over the last 30 years, his livelihood has disappeared along with the water in the sea. Or this man, A.C. Shun and his son Christian, Fathers, like those of you listening and watching right now, just for a moment, imagine being forced to face your sons or daughters, knowing you're burdening them with farms so dry, nothing will grow, dams so parched, I could run across them. It's easy to listen to these stories and think that they're someone else's problem, but they're not. They're our problem too. And here's why. Water goes into everything we use, we buy and we consume every single day. From the coffee you drank this morning to the smart clothes that you put on to join this call to the mobile phone you might be dialing in from or which is sitting on the desk beside you or tucked into your pocket. Just that one outfit took more water to make than all the water you've drunk in your entire lifetime. Just one outfit. And I'm pretty confident most of you have more than one. Let's be straight here. 
I don't run because I'm good at it, because I'm a natural or because I like running ridiculously long distances in extreme environments. No. I run because of kids like these displaced because of the water crisis in Syria and living in refugee camps, kids around the world, kids who are growing into a world where the water crisis affects billions of people across the planet. When I'm struggling to take another step in the baking heat and cappuccino-coloured dust of the Atacama Desert or on the banks of the Thames being beaten on the head by hail, what keeps me going is the thought of these kids, of the future we want to leave for them. And I can tell you right now, it's not the future we've got. To be honest, I've never been able to understand or explain our lack of action, meaningful action on water. Climate is on the front page of the papers. You can't miss it. It's debated at the G8, the G20, and every other G and major political convening around the world. It's on corporate agendas, and CEOs talk about it. And we know that water and climate are linked. So where is water? Talk to a CEO, a board member, or a head of a supply chain in a major multinational corporation, and most of them will glaze over at the topic of water. Most of them have absolutely no idea how their supply chains are truly impacted by water. And in a way, it's understandable. They're in boardrooms, halfway around the world from where these problems exist. And like most of us, they're living in those same places where water comes out of the taps, power is plentiful, and groceries are available at the local stores. And perhaps even more importantly, consumers don't ask, so why should they? This may all be true, but it's also not an excuse. So what can we do? We need to create a better elevator pitch one that helps all of us, one that lifts the tide so all of our boats rise too, one that recognises that we need action in six simple buckets, quality, quantity, wash, valuing water, transparency and collective action, six for six. One that acknowledges that if we can get more action on each of these, will increase the pool of funders and collaborators for everyone, which is good for all of you, right? But it's especially good for water. But the thing about these elevator pitches is that they don't work without some sense of urgency. And for this, we need to show we care. Not the we of the water sector, but the we of the world. And that means mobilising individuals, consumers, voters, investors, people who are prepared to step up and publicly say, we want action on water. In 2018, I set out to run 100 marathons in 100 days. My goal was to create a bold and ambitious expedition to the coalface of the water crisis one that would capture the media's attention and help me to put water onto the global agenda. And to be honest, it was great. We got huge media, we ran lots of miles and we told incredible stories from amazing people, many of which I've already shared with you today. And we hit major milestones, billions of media impressions, millions of people reached and lots and lots of marathons run. But in the background, I knew I had a problem. And at the end of marathon number 62, where my team carried me into our car, I knew I needed some pretty serious help. The next day, we went to hospital. I was terrified. 
I was terrified about the damage I knew I'd done to my body. But I was even more scared about what that damage would mean for the impact I'd been so determined to make. And as I sat in my wheelchair after the scan, I listened but did not hear the doctors explain I had a 15 centimetre fracture in my leg. And that meant no more running. Darkness fell. The campaign was literally done. Confucius said, it doesn't matter how slow you go, as long as you keep going. Later that day, I watched from my wheelchair as my team took on my miles, day 63. And on day 64, they were joined by people from across Cape Town. And then day after day, more people stepping up to show their support, a wave of momentum rolling around the world. Place after place, country after country, a boldly optimistic, radically inclusive community of thousands of people across over 145 countries around the world, stepping up for water, sharing their passion, their stories, and their desire to say, we care. Run or walk the world for water. Let's do it. You brought heart, you brought smiles, thousands and thousands and thousands of people showing how much they all value water. Hi everyone, we're in Guerrero, and this is where we're going to do our last run for the World Water Run. What are we doing? Trekking for show! Yeah! Thank you, you are incredible human beings and I'm enormously grateful to be part of this alongside every single one of you. Thanks for supporting us, thanks for being part of this run from day one. Water. We are continuing to build this momentum, this movement for change, and we're heading for the steps of the United Nations on World Water Day in 2023. It's the opening of the first UN conference on water in over 50 years, and it's an opportunity for us to move this issue forward to show we care. Not the we of water, but the we of the world. That boldly optimistic, radically inclusive community of millions of everyday heroes right around the world who are stepping up to say, we want action on water. And as they ask, we have a choice. Every single one of us. Individuals, companies, investors, NGOs. We can turn our backs and we can walk away. Or we can rise to the challenge, to sign up to walk or run with us, commit to helping to recruit others to join the campaign. Individuals, companies, governments, NGOs, you. Go online and share your stories, your ideas, your solutions. Tag me so we can amplify your voice. But most importantly, Commit to taking real, meaningful action on water, your version of our six for six, and stand with us on the steps of the UN, not for me or for you, but for all of us everywhere. You can make this happen. Because whilst individually you can make an impact, together, we can change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mina for her contribution. And now I would like to welcome our panelists for this session. Uh, welcome to Preeta Prabhakaran, uh, a water sanitation and hygiene specialist at UNICEF Indonesia. Evelyn Atram, a climate justice activist from Uganda. 
Uh, Pia Yasuko Rask, the Senior Director of Safe Water at Grundfos, Denmark. And Samson Mokwena, uh, a coordinator at Val Environmental Justice Alliance in South Africa. Welcome to you all and thank you for joining us this session. So, um, in the segment, we saw that Mina managed to create a movement around water by using physical challenges as a method uh, for increasing awareness. And you have all experiences uh, from various ways to create awareness uh, about climate change, uh, sanitation, pollution and water. So, what are some tricks and tools you have learned about um, how to make people care about an issue? So let's start with you, Pritham. Thank you, Anders. Um, I would like to start by saying that the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda of 2030 uh, offers us a historic opportunity to achieve transformational change uh, for children around the world. And this is because all these 17 SDG goals are interlinked, which means that if we are not able to achieve one goal, it would be difficult to achieve any of the other goals. So the uh, SDG 6, which uh, talks about um, universal, sustainable and equitable access to water, sanitation and hygiene is one such example. And this sits at the heart uh, of the SDG agenda, because unless we're able to achieve the uh, SDG 6 goals of uh, WASH, uh, we won't be able to achieve the other um, goals, say, for example, SDG 4, which talks about health and well-being, or SDG, um, uh, I'm sorry, SDG 4 talks about educational outcomes for children, SDG 3, which talks about health and well-being. Um, so UNICEF acts as a key advocate uh, for children um, in the WASH sector. And in the work that we do on WASH in different countries in the world, uh, we work with governments to strengthen national capacities and national systems um, for bringing about lasting, uh, lasting sustainable change um, in, in the in the WASH sector. And what would be some what would be some methods for you to reaching out to the people? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one is at the macro level. Uh, you know, we work on evidence generation. Uh, which, um, you know, includes uh, efforts to get information and data on WASH um, and to translate that into what it means for children. And, um, you know, so, for example, as part of the COVID response last year, we worked on a national analysis of WASH in schools data and WASH in healthcare facilities data, which shows that, you know, um, like, for example, 16 percent of schools in Indonesia do not have access to uh, adequate water sanitation and hygiene facilities or that 26 percent of healthcare facilities do not have basic sanitation. You know, so this data is used uh, for, in, in order to advocate for change um, and to set priorities within the wash sector and also to support the policy maker in their planning and strategy processes. Now, when we look at it in the micro level, um, we work on changing behavior and establishing social norms, um, you know, for wash activities, which includes, for example, stopping open defecation or promoting hygiene practices, which would include hand washing practices or um, methods for water uh, safety uh, and water treatment within households. Thank you, Pritha. And uh, Pia, what are your methods for, for reaching out to um, various audiences and create awareness? Thanks a lot, and, and thanks a lot for, for having me. And I was just reflecting on what, what Preeta said, and I think it's it's so important to stress the connection to other SDGs. Um, I think uh, what Preeta said about uh, collaborating with governments is really important in, in the awareness creation that you make as, as UNICEF. Uh, and I often think about SDG 16 that we don't often talk about when we talk about water. SDG 13 is strong institutions, and I think... This is really one of the areas where we as a, as a private company as well uh, struggle a bit because when we sign, for instance, public-private partnership uh, contracts, the strong institutional element is so important for us to, you know, really scale and, and live out um, the contracts that we make to to make water available. I think sports, talking about that and, and returning to that, is, is, a, is a great medium to create more, you know, general global awareness. Grundfos, uh, for instance... Um, uses uh, the platforms we have handball world cup and, and european cups are one of them where we sponsor sgg 6 and 13 
Um, so when when goals are made, a uh, sixth uh, and and thirteenth goal, we will then donate. And of course, it's not the donation itself that's important. It's actually creating awareness to an audience that normally would perhaps not know about the SDGs or know about water and climate. So, so that's one way of using our platforms um, as, as a private sector player in this space as well to say we all have a role to play in the SDGs and in making water available um, for all. So, so perhaps that's uh, the examples I would bring forward at, uh, at, this, at this point in time. Thank you, Pia. And Samson, you, you work with creating awareness around uh, environmental issues uh, using uh, legal action. So, so how can legal action be a means of creating awareness? Thank you. Um, first, in South Africa, water is a scarce uh, commodity and a resource. And it's a contested resource because of private sector interest, uh, a government making sure that there is a proper supply of households and making sure that agriculture is sustained. So it is a, a, a contested a, a commodity. What has happened is that constitutionally water is guaranteed under Section 37 of South African Constitution. That's the first thing that we have making sure that all communities that we work with, especially people with disadvantaged groups, people who, uh, who work on the uh, traditional medicines, uh, women's groups, that they are fully aware and they are involved in water governance at their local uh, uh, level, where decisions making are taken to make sure that water allocations are properly uh, uh, managed. And what we have used is a legal framework that under Section 37 of the Constitution, it is guaranteed. And national legislation must then talk to that and uh, provide for that. And where there is a, a contested debate in terms of allocations, it's where fundamentally we capacitate our uh, particular disadvantaged groups to make sure that their right is not trampled with, because Constitutionally, that has been guaranteed. Because what has happened in a number of occasions is where water allocation is skewed towards the interest of the poor, of the, of the rich and the, uh, and, uh, and the powerful. And the previously disadvantaged groups are then left behind. Hence, we then produce a, a proper booklet to summarize the, 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 the local framework to say, this is your right under the Constitution. And the state have brought this legislation to make sure that your right is, is met by the state. And at the center of decision making, community groups, we mobilize them to be at the table, in the, especially in the, in, in the systems where there is a, 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 a management systems that must happen at the local level. We encourage our groups to be at the table where decision making are happen, hmm. so that that right is properly protected. <laughs> Thank you, Samson. And, and Evelyn, you are uh, a climate justice activist and also uh, involved in Fridays for Future and do a lot of, of uh, awareness work. What are your um, strategies and methods for creating awareness about climate change? Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, I would like to say I agree with all the speakers. I, I love their I love their points and I really agree with them. As an activist, um, climate change cuts across so many sectors. Uh, climate, uh, the climate crisis is a water crisis. It's every crisis. Yeah, so um, I would like to talk on a general point of view uh, to make a uh, message get out there, or personally as I make my message get out, out there, um, you make sure you re, you return you reiterate a message and keep speaking about it. You continue talking about it, sharing it on so many plus platforms as many platforms and, and as possible. And with time, this starts getting into people's ears, and you find that so many people are actually joining you. With time, the media starts amplifying your work. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, what can be some of the challenges you, you meet when, uh, when you are um, trying to create awareness? Uh, I mean, um, Preetha, you are talking about creating also behavior change uh, in the public. What, what are some of the challenges that, uh, that you face when reaching out to people? Yeah, if I can take uh, hand washing with soap as an example, you know, which has been in the spotlight, uh, you know, with the COVID response. Uh, for example, it's important not only to increase access to hand washing facilities, but it's also very important now to bring about, you know, hygiene behavior change and get people to wash their hands on a regular and consistent basis. Um, so now we're looking at a situation where we cannot count on incremental changes happening over a period of time. We're talking about, you know, simultaneous changes 
that has to happen uh, you know almost all at once across uh, you know different uh, segments of the population targeting different um, sections uh, of people who have different motivations who have different circumstances who have different access to facilities and services um so it is extremely challenging when we're talking about behavior change and promoting these sustainable hygiene practices um so what we've uh, done in the last one year in indonesia in our work to promote uh, you know hygiene behavior change for example is uh, one to really look at um, you know uh, getting the message across to different platforms different channels different networks so we've uh, partnered with uh, you know the private sector uh you know to come up with really innovative messaging and to reach out to different stakeholders to different platforms uh, it's also important to really um identify the behavior change factors for different segments of the population and to really build on this evidence you know and we've seen through our wash programming over the years uh, especially <coughs> in the uh, campaigns that we have implemented to stop open defecation for example uh, how powerful using emotional triggers can be you know so uh, using emotional triggers to really get people connected to an issue and to bring about uh, you know behavior change or 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 improve uh, you know hygiene practices is very important can you give us one uh, example of, of one such emotional trigger uh yes so we did a formative research last year to really understand what is it that makes people wash their hands and one powerful factor is uh, social norms uh it's very important the whole sense of approval uh was very important uh, to people and approval from uh, a figure of authority uh from the decision makers is very important you know so in designing these behavior change interventions we have actually you know uh, got uh, the ministers or the decision makers influencers to record videos and to record messages and then we have broadcasted that through different channels um another very important factor for example is um, you know the feeling of having clean hands um so it's not only you know which which came as a surprise for us in terms of uh, you know um, a lot of men spoke about liking the idea of you know having clean hands and and also they spoke about the factor of smell you know so here you know so these factors can really be used to design messages that we can you know get across to people in terms of really motivating them to wash their hands um in indonesia we also have a very young population 16% of the population is is the youth so using the youth networks uh is very important so we have a network of 400000 youth reporters for example so engaging them you know in in our in our programs to really engage with people uh, to be powerful agents of change has been a very very uh, important strategy for us thank you peter and and i would like like to c- come back to evelyn uh, to talk about some of your challenges uh, you you face when you're reaching out to to people and create awareness about uh, climate change what are some challenges that you face um there's one challenge that, that uh, almost every act- activist faces uh, and those are trolls you find so many people criticizing what you're doing what you t- what you're telling them but this should not discourage you uh, uh trolls only mean that you actually speaking the truth and if you know you're speaking the truth then you just have to you have to keep spreading the message you have to keep doing what you do because you know that eventually one day one time uh these people people will join you these people will understand your work they will understand what you're doing and the other challenge that most activists are facing and me inclusive like early this year i got arrested while uh protesting uh peacefully in front of the parliament of uganda i got arrested with two other activists and i was threatened uh we were told so many scary things um and of course this really scares us we we are we are limited to going to public places to do our strikes to speak to people uh but we have to keep doing this because we are speaking the truth so what we do these days we just um um strike from home or from a place which is far from town and put this message out there on social media on different social media platforms as we wait for the rules or for our leaders to get to support us on this mm. Thank you Evelyn. And and uh, Pia what are your comments and reflections on these challenges? Yeah, I was thinking about it and and I think I think that 
as a private sector company, we're, we're of course always very aware that that um, you know the greenwashing uh, elements of this. You know, how far can we go in our messaging um, without getting shot down for saying, yeah, you just want to sell something. And of course, that's very true. We do want to sell something, but when we talk about something like water access, when we talk about the global goals, um, I really do feel that as a company, we are also part of a bigger whole of creating awareness um, globally and together with others. It's it's a plus sum game. If we can, um, you know, improve capabilities uh, together with UNICEF, if we can reach more communities with Samsung and Evelyn, if we can, you know, get the message out there, it's a plus sum game. It's not about one for selling stuff. It's about giving people choices and for them to understand the choices they have and what roles and responsibilities each of us can have in, in reaching those targets. So so I think for us, the big challenge is, of course, always this balancing, um, you know, what is the role of private sector? How far can we go in in, in our role as communicators and, and raising global awareness? And, and I think that's why we always try to partner as well, because we are trying to do good. And it would be so terrible if we end up doing bad. But we also have to, you know, not be scared of um, somebody, you know, trying to chase us down and say, yeah, you're just trying to sell something. Because then we get also too afraid to even say something. So so I think that balance is actually one of the big challenges we have as, as private sector players in this space, because we are dealing with some, you know, some very challenging topics and sometimes with some of the world's most vulnerable um, communities. Mm. So, so I think that that's the challenge that I want to to um, to bring out here. Thank you, Pia. And Samson, what are your reflections on uh, what yeah. Pia said, and also what challenges you you face in in your work, in your daily work? I think I like that point where we must not shut that, shut down each other in the spaces of engagement, particularly where water is at the center of of development, and we have that experience in South Africa because. The water management in, in this country is quite complex. And those who previously have a, 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 a right to water as individuals, because that right has been taken away as in the hands of the state. And that it must be shared amongst all of us. And it must be sure that we, we, we listen to each other. And one of the things that Evelyn have said of threats, activists continuously being threatened by other uh, legal uh, <laughs> uh, suits, that's something that have emerged in South Africa when we are in these meetings. Especially big corporation, they shut you down. You don't know what you're talking about, you know. And that is a particular threat because privileged disadvantaged groups they need to be on the table to engage with the, with the private sector and those who privileged have got that right to make sure also that their that that particular right right to access to water is protected for their own uh, 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 health and well-being. So that is one fundamental that I think we need to as, as all stakeholders to listen to each other. And one of the things that we have done as, as, as Veja in, in our region is to, to take the traditional healers who work on the water on a daily basis and do a study with them and take that study presented to big companies. They were shocked to see that not only their water uh, interest must trample to another, other groups, because also that those groups have that fundamental right to that water. And that made a huge uh, change where even the state are now in, in, uh, enacting and, and, and amending the South African water, water law to make sure that people who are using water for traditional uh, issues, they are also on the table and their rights are being protected. And, and, and that's what one of the things that uh, behavior change that we need to engage. Let's engage around each, um, amongst our uh, different stakeholders to make sure that we protect uh, uh, water rights, uh, not at the local level, but at the global level. Thank you, Samson. And you talked before about how important it is to include uh, all voices. And um, it's uh, sometimes, um, do we need different strategies for creating awareness depending on how people value water or how people value different issues? Because uh, uh, you can value, for example, water differently if you are affected by uh, catastrophes or are, you are living in a safe environment or, or depending on your sort of position in, uh, in society. So how can we make sure that all voices are, are heard to get sort of the people on the top to know about people's reality. Evelyn, what, what are your reflections on that? Um, this starts with the local media. Uh, if the local media can actually amplify voices of people in the local community, especially people from most affected communities, then this can actually get people's stories higher 
heard by the international media, heard by the world out there. But unfortunately, uh, the local media, most of the local media are not actually supportive of of uh, most of the work that the youth are doing or that people are doing, which is related to the environment, which is related to protection of the planet. But if uh, if we get more support from the local media, then uh, we'll have more voices of people amplified. We cannot wait for international media amplifying our voices because this may take a long time. Thank you, Evelyn. And Pia, what are your reflections? Do we need different strategies to, of creating awareness depending on how people value water? I think that that's an excellent uh, point from, from Evelyn, uh, for sure, that... that um, you know, you need different messages and, and you need to address the, the needs and challenges that each stakeholder groups have and, and each um, person along the value chain, the water value chain. And, and the end user is very different from local government, who is very different from, from the global community. So I think this is a, a point we touched on in, in the previous discussion as well, that that um, it, to really reach and to really, you know, get people to think about it, um, you need to also understand that audience and who you're talking to and really target your messaging and your communication um, to that particular group. Otherwise, you know, it, it's 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 not going to be possible to uh, to resonate with each of them. So I think Evelyn's point is is uh, is very true that um, you know we cannot solve uh, the, the 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 let's say awareness and communication challenge very locally. Um, that has to be done, you know, exactly where Evelyn is in the village or even sometimes door to door. So uh, so I think it's an excellent point. And, and we try to, of course, focus on our strengths and then we always collaborate locally. So I think to, to both Samson and Evelyn's point, you know, when we work in communities um, as a technology provider, we don't. We don't do it alone. You know, we, we work with uh, um, organizations like uh, like Evelyn comes from and Samson comes from uh, with UNICEF and others who have an expertise on exactly how to approach communities to engage in a good and proper way. So it's um, not one way communication, but actually two way communication and, and mutual understanding, because that that's when we can create change, I think. Samson, what are your comments on including all voices and make sure everyone is heard? No, I agree. I think local media play a critical role to make sure that they disseminate uh, correct and proper information to local communities. And co co once com communities understand what, what, what messages is coming up, they will always uh, uh, respond uh, positively and participate in that uh, uh, water governance, decision-making processes, protecting water, and making sure that they, that water is, is protected for the future generation. That's one uh, fundamental strategy that is always on play. Uh, communication, 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 including stakeholders, bring them into board to make sure that they also uh, 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 participate and not, they're not just observers <laughs> uh, uh, on the process. Thank you, Samson. And, and Preeta, um, you uh, are doing large-scale initiatives for, for creating awareness around uh, water sanitation hygiene. So how do you measure your impact? Can you measure uh, your awareness? Uh, yes, awareness can be measured. Um, so traditionally in our programming, uh, you know, all, all over the world, um, also different organizations, you know, the methods that that were adopted were more in terms of giving out information uh, with the aim of building people's awareness around an issue and knowledge around an issue and, and thinking that that would translate into practice or action. Uh, but over the years, we realized that just because people know about something, that doesn't mean they really practice it. You know, so in terms of now, um, so when we now uh, try and measure uh, awareness building or, um, or, or, or uh, you know, the knowledge of a person uh, related to a certain issue, we really look at how that translates into practice. So, uh, it's, you know, so if we want to measure hand washing, um, uh, hand washing with soap, it's important to look at or observe uh, the practice of hand washing. So in Indonesia last year, we developed a national uh, hygiene monitoring system uh, to uh, uh, monitor the compliance to uh, COVID related hygiene behaviors, which is uh, proper mask usage, uh, safe distancing and hand washing with soap practice. Um, and this had very clear indicators and parameters uh, to monitor if people were washing their hands or maintaining safe distance or wearing their mask properly. Um, so it's very clearly measured in terms of uh, practice of, of 
uh, of behavior, which is actually means that people are aware about an issue. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, we are going to conclude uh, this uh, panel discussion s- soon, but, but I just want to ask you a last question, and that is, um, you know, people's memory is uh, very short, and uh, the media's memory is perhaps even shorter sometimes. So how do you create I- I awareness that, that will last, for lasting for change? So, Pia, what's your reflections on that? Uh, that's a gigantic question. <laughs> I <laughs> yes. don't know what to, to respond. And you have 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 30 seconds and we'll save the world. Um, I, I, I think, uh, I don't think it's it's worth repeating what everyone said, but I think those are sort of the ingredients. You know, it's it has to be is something people can emotionally connect to because that's when you understand, that's when you change behavior and it has to be appropriate, you know, for, for the audience you're talking to. So, Water challenges are often very, very local. And I think that's why you were also talking about local media here, right? Because they will be able to address and speak to the exact challenges that people have locally and can connect to and tell the stories that are meaningful to them to actually go about um, creating the change and and, uh, pull these triggers of change that that we'll need to to really make a difference here. Thank you, Pia. And Prisa, your 30 seconds to change the world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, behavior change interventions, um, you know, should target systemic change. I, I don't think, you know, there's any way out of it. Um, so it should be about reinforcing messages in innovative ways, uh, you know, targeting a different segment population with different uh, tailor-made messages. And it should be about establishing social norms and about establishing habits. So once it becomes a habit, people will remember it and they will practice it, you know, all their lives. So it has to be about reinforcing habits. Thank you, Peter. And Samson? Yeah, I think from our side, because we work within the legal framework, uh, once we have made sure that the, the legal framework is sound and, and sustainable and the state is able to respond to the local issues, uh, that for us is it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, a, a change to make sure that uh, the state is, 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 is accountable to the citizens and making sure that they provide water as a guarantee in our constitution and our, our local legislation. If that can be a lasting solution for us, that will be our, 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 our success. Thank you, Samson. And Evelyn? Um, I think, uh, like I said earlier, reiterating a message, a, 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 a crisis message is very important. You can't talk about it once or twice or three times. You must talk about it until you see results. Yeah, if you if you keep talking about it, you'll find that more people are actually joining, more people are getting involved and are understanding, because I believe that people can only act when they are informed. Without people having this knowledge, uh, we'll not be doing anything. And people need to understand that uh, the climate crisis is a water crisis. And this message has to be spread out there and has to be emphasized even to the different activists around the world. Because in activism, uh, most times you're talking about green, like the forests, but uh, you find that uh, there's less talk about water. So I would like to... I'd like to encourage everyone listening and even the activists that we also fight for the water. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you all for participating in this session. Thank you to our lead partner, the Grundfos Foundation. Don't forget to look at More Than Words, showcasing effective storytelling on water, where visual and performing artists address urgent climate and water issues. You can find these events on the center stage. Join us again tomorrow for the third accelerator on communication and behavior change. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.